We, we need to learn to see the world anew. You allow outside expertise to bring uh, innovative ideas to you, technologies, business processes, and then as a leader, you get to decide which ones you want to take on. Welcome to Work Inspired, a podcast where leaders in business, commercial real estate, technology, and design come together to discuss change, challenge, and opportunity in today's professional world. This show is powered by BOS, a leader in commercial interiors. The team of workplace experts at BOS is equipped and ready to help you navigate the path to your next workspace. Whether you're a seasoned leader or just starting out in your career, you're gonna learn something new today. So sit back, relax, enjoy, and get ready to work inspired. Hello and welcome to the Work Inspired Podcast. I'm your host, George Lucas Pfeiffer, and today we've got an incredible guest on the show, the CIO of Trader Joe's, Dr. Ron Glickman. We're gonna be talking about change, innovation, opportunity, culture, so many great topics. Let's just dive right in. This is Work Inspired. Ron, thank you for being here on the show. So excited to speak with you today about pretty important things, I think. Change, innovation, opportunity. Uh, thank you for being here on Work Inspired Podcast. It's my pleasure, George. Thanks for having me. So tell me a little bit about your professional story. Who is Ron Glickman? So from a professional point of view, I've been driving big, big change programs for my entire career. I started out as a technology guy, went through my technical training early in my career, worked at Electronic Data Systems, which is where I got sort of my foundational work. Um, but getting through that, I've been kind of in leadership roles in a variety of different contexts. So in one retail company uh, that was acquired by private equity folks, I was brought in as their first CIO, and we actually had to build technology infrastructure from scratch. Everything was done manually. So we had to do everything from new processes to an item file to, to PCs, the whole, the whole works. Um, after that, uh, I went uh, and lived in Hong Kong, worked for a British conglomerate where I got to experience a sort of different culture, leading change in a different culture. And my job was to create a shared services strategy for three brands owned by that conglomerate and all of the challenges that go with getting uh, herding cats and getting everybody to, uh, to work together. Um, later on, I worked for duty-free shops after 9-11. Our uh, sales dropped 50% overnight, and the leadership team was challenged to cut expenses by half in 90 days to save the business. And uh, we had to do a number of transformational things from a technology point of view, and that's where I got into uh, global sourcing and, and offshore uh, services to try to find a way to improve productivity and cut costs at the same time. My last job Prior to joining Trader Joe's, I was hired by the owner of a supply chain company who had purchased 50 businesses in 69 countries. Wow. And my job was to create one enterprise technology organization for the globe, which had some challenges. And now at TJ's, I'm at a very successful, well-managed company, and we've been driving what I would call more evolutionary change. Uh, based on you know what the needs of the business were at the time, so number of different contexts uh, learned a lot about how to build cultures and make change happen, and it's something I'm passionate about and 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 teach outside of work at uh, at Cal State uh, University Los Angeles. How's that? Does that it. help? That's great. Yeah. In fact, I think that that it was something I want to unpack a little bit more, and maybe we'll wait a couple of questions. But that 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 idea of uh, someone in your role balancing risk mitigation and and almost the emergency side of change the challenges of change with also the opportunities you know with forward thinking with growth with, with innovation i think that's fascinating because how much of your resource or how do you respond uh, how do you set up a team and an infrastructure so that you're not constantly looking backwards putting out fires but you're able to also look forwards and i think like you just said it probably has something to do with the the organizational structure, the culture of the business, the team that in, that's in place, uh, and then the technology that you pick. But uh, really fascinating background. Thanks for sharing that. Um, yep. As we as we talk about change, I mean, we're coming out hopefully of one of the most significant periods of change most professionals have lived through with the the COVID nineteen pandemic. Clearly, many many industries have have faced unprecedented change, if that word is not too overused by now, but uh, 
but talk about that a little bit. What are what are some of the most challenge the, the biggest challenges that your team has faced um, based off of where we're at today and what's gone on over the last two years? So I'm I'm really fortunate. I mean, as I mentioned, TJ is a very successful, well managed company, and um, so we and we in our technology group had been working on a business continuity plan for quite some time, and so the kind of shift to work from home for us was really about taking our business continuity plan outside of the conference room and actually executing it real time. Strategically, the business and the leaders who run this organization are very focused on what we do and what we don't do. So unlike many businesses who had to reinvent their business model and you know were kind of chasing opportunities that were maybe outside their core, we really focused on sticking to our core business, taking care of our customers, taking care of the people who work for the organization. And so as a technology leader, it's a pleasure to work in a context like that. So I'd love to tell you, I have a bunch of war stories, but really we just stuck to our knitting and put one foot in front of the other and made sure that the folks who are running the business had what they need to serve our customers in the stores. Well, I'll tell you, we were discussing this conversation with my team yesterday and talking just about the experience that we have as consumers uh, as we go to different grocery stores. And Trader Joe's, I feel like, has kind of stayed as 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 normal as we. I mean, there's not been a ton of change there, and that's been really refreshing. You go in there, and and there's. There's produce in the shelves, you know, there's the pricing's not gone and skyrocketed. Uh, you know, I, I think obviously logistics and supply chain have been big problems that a lot of businesses have faced and inflation is another another challenge. But I I, I, I would say, yeah, if, as, a, as someone who's consuming and, and one of your customers, I, I feel like what you just said is spot on. Oh, um, that's so cool. Love to hear how, that. And it's not that we're not without challenges, but sure. when, you ha- when you have a culture that is 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 supportive and pragmatic and deals with reality uh, as it comes you know you don't have the fear that you might have being uh you know being pressured to do things that are impossible or that you know that the organization's not ready to do so that's that's awesome to hear we're glad you're a customer <laughs> we love it uh t- t- well then let's look at the other side of it so so easy, you know overcoming challenges uh, you were able to have an infrastructure in place that allowed you to kind of stay the course to some extent and not be drastically or dramatically impacted by some of the changes that uh, we faced in the last couple of years. How about opportunity as we move forward? You know, uh, the, the pandemic has made a lot of people rethink work, rethink how they uh, run their businesses uh, and, and, and looking to the future. How have you um, how have you guys looked at some of the, you know, just the current climate? And said, "Here's the here's the new way we're moving forward." Or are you are you thinking that things will go back to the ways that they were in 2019 and before the pandemic? Well, you know, listen, I I, I don't want to speak for the organization per se, but I can talk about technology and you know, sort of my specific area, and it's really challenging right now. I mean, individuals are rethinking based on having worked at home for such a long time. You know what that means to them in their lives. There are many people who are interested in working full time at home, who want to have some kind of a hybrid work strategy, and that's certainly uh, creating some pressure. I think the market is a little bit crazy right now relative to compensation, which makes it difficult uh, to find folks. And in in a retail organization, it's always difficult to get people who. Um, believe in the business and the brand and understand that technology in our context is an enabler. It's a means to an end and not an end in itself. So we're never going to be leading edge. Let's do the newest thing. You know, for example, we don't have a cloud strategy. You know, we, we, we put our compute and our applications and our technology where it needs to be based on applications that our business needs to be successful. We don't constrain our business with a strategy that says you can only do things that operate in a cloud, for example, or you can only sure. do things that operate on a on a particular database. So, you know, I think going forward, the competition for talent is going to be a really important thing that's on my mind. And, you know, uh, my my objective is never going to change. Find people with the right attitude and behaviors that love our brand, that understand who we are and who we're not. And 
get them in the right seat on the bus to help, you know, drive us forward. And uh, I think some of the things I just talked about will make that a little more complicated than they've been in the past. Uh, I feel super confident I have what I need to to, to sort that out. But, um, you know, it's not going to be easy. You know, where the world goes, um, I, I'm not one to to make that prediction. <laughs> I'm not bold enough. <laughs> Well, you've definitely had a, a history of of working in organizations where there's been significant challenges. As you kind of went through your professional story, that that's very evident. Do you have any advice for leaders that are facing change and are looking for some ways to turn that into growth opportunities um, or just opportunity in general? For me, living through change is the is a massive growth opportunity if you're paying attention. You know, uh, it's a very uncomfortable thing. And as long as you're um, in your in your discomfort zone and you're not panicked, you can, you know, respond and learn as you go. You know, the way the brain works when we're panicked, blood goes to our arms and legs so we can run or fight and we're not capable of thinking critically. So I never want people to be in a panic situation. But change is uncomfortable. And if you view uncomfortable as a learning opportunity, and you pay attention to uh, the things that make you uncomfortable, the mistakes that you make, and the successes that, that you have, and you try to harvest the lessons from each one of those things, I think as a change leader, that's just a golden opportunity. Um, in terms of specific change, it's really easy when your hair's on fire. You know, like when, when the duty-free challenge came after 9-11, there was no question by any leader in the organization that we understood what we had to do. We needed to save the business. We all needed to go forward uh, in unison and it was difficult, but there weren't any, what I would call people resistant to change because they didn't understand the goal or their belief system was incongruent with where some people were going. So that's an easier kind of change. I think COVID brought some of that. It's like, we got to get people working from home Let's get after it, you know, and people were probably more tolerant than they might have been, you know, if uh, if things were a little bit, you know, more calm. You know, you get into a situation where you're driving change because there's a mandate to get everyone into a common culture on the same page. You're going to get people who have been successful doing what they've done for their whole career, who are either going to actively resist that because they think they know better or passively resist it because they sort of know what the politic is, but, you know, their behavior is not necessarily congruent with that. That makes it real hard for change, for change sure. agents. And, you know, you can't change from the bottom up. You need, you need that leader at the top to get everybody to align and make the hard decisions. Last thing I'd say about that is the reward system will tell you a, a lot about whether you're going to be successful or not. So, and what I mean by that is, you know, I've been in situations uh, where we've made an acquisition and uh, the people who were acquired were being rewarded based on earnings for the next several years. So when you try to do things in a common way and make things better, that requires investment. So on the one hand, you're saying we got to bring everyone together and we're going to make investment. But on the other, you have people saying, not if it impacts my ability to pay my rent and send my kids to college. You know? sure. yep. So you, know, you, you have to go look at the reward system. And when you reward system people for behaviors that are congruent with the change mission, that makes it a lot easier for, for people who are involved in making things happen. If that, if that, does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. I especially yeah. resonate with the, it's a lot easier to change when you have to than when everything's going well, right? So I think that related to where a lot of businesses find themselves today, uh, that makes a ton of sense. And, and, and therefore is the opportunity, right? Uh, I, I, I want to talk about the, the idea of innovation, because one of the things we've heard is that productivity seems to be very uh, possible from home. In fact, some, some studies show that people are even more productive from home than they are in the workplace. But we have heard people say that innovation may have suffered. You know, people kind of get into a rhythm, they're comfortable in their home, they're getting the stuff done, but there's not a lot of... Uh, I don't know. There's different studies that show and measure innovation as far as employee engagement or uh, collaboration capability, those types of things. So from your experience, is this does this resonate at all? Have you found that innovation has 
decreased, stayed the same, or increased over the last couple of years as your, most of your employees have probably been, your office employees have probably been in a remote setting? Yeah, I don't think that innovate, I don't think where we sit has necessarily impacted um, what we're achieving. I, I, think, I think the fundamental issue is, are you clear on the outcomes that you're expecting? Okay. And does everybody understand? And when I think of a continuum of outcomes on one extreme from an innovation point of view, I would describe as breakthrough oriented outcomes. And these are outcomes that are defined when people think what you want to do is impossible. Like when they think you, what you want to do is impossible, then you know you're going for what I call a breakthrough. And the certainty in that context is relatively low, but the value for achieving that goal is often quite high. Uh, on the other extreme, you're dealing with sort of incremental change where you, know, you already know what you need to do. You need to tweak something. Let's say you have sales of 1,000 you know, and you need to get to, you know, 1100, that's a 10% increase. So uh, the, the value of that is going to be relatively low, but the certainty will be quite high because, you know, it's really within your wheelhouse to sort of make that incremental step. On the breakthrough side, if you say, I want to take a thousand and triple it, then people are going to say, well, I have no idea how to do that. And then you're in that different, different context. And so once you understand that, then you can set the pace. You could think about the people that you need, the know-how that's required, maybe some outside expertise to help. And, and when that becomes clear, it's, it's less important, in my opinion, um, whether you're working from home uh, or in the office or in some kind of a hybrid mode. Um, but there is an argument for just the hallway conversation and being a pop into somebody's you know, office or desk area and and shooting the breeze. I mean, you can you can zoom bomb folks, but it's different. Sure. Does that make sense? Yeah, very much so. And I, I you know, as it relates to those breakthroughs, I'm guessing that you would suggest a, a balance of both. You can't just do incremental change. You need to have some breakthrough type goals, but you can't also also only have breakthroughs without the incremental change. Is that right? As far as innovate a culture of innovation, you kind of need to have some mix of both of those types. I think that's that. I, th I think that that's correct. So what I would say is, if you're in a a mature business or a growing business, you need a portfolio of projects that that span that. You got to get your operations right and continue to improve on the margin. And then there's going to be some amount of innovation required to grow, to take on competition, to move into new markets. If you're in a startup. You know, you don't have anything on the margin sure. to do. You want to create a breakthrough so that you can land and, you know, make a big difference and be disruptive, right? So I think it depends a little bit on context, but you're absolutely right. If you're in an ongoing, you know, enterprise, that mix is really what's, is what's required. And the more successful you are, uh, it's the more difficult it is to get the innovation stuff off the ground because you have people with points of view that you really need to dig in and, um, work on their beliefs and their values and uh, kind of where they fit in the organization to help get them to a place where they're going to come on the journey. And ultimately, if, uh, if that doesn't work out, then you have to decide, are your policies such that you can help people exit so they can go find a place where they could be comfortable? Or do you have to bring them along? And if you have to bring them along, it's going to curtail your ability to, you know, to, make, to make big things happen. Sure. Regarding that with the breakthroughs, I, do you think it's a, I know I'm guessing it's the size of the team or the type of the business, like you just said, but as it relates to how many breakthroughs can you try to achieve at one time? If you think that, well, if the breakthrough <coughs> definition is that nobody thinks it's possible. So low likelihood of it being accomplished, right? Do you then say, I'm going to try, I'm going to set my team on the course for four breakthroughs this year, and maybe we'll get one of them. Or I'm thinking like, NASA getting to the moon when the, you know, the United States challenged that. That was the one goal, right? Breakthrough type goal, but one goal, we're all going to row in that direction and we're going to achieve it even though nobody thinks it's possible. <laughs> Do you have any guidance as it relates to kind of casting a wider net or hyper-focused on one specific large change? You know, I think all of this is related to the strategy of the business that you're supporting from a technology perspective in, in my case, right? So it's always about 
what are the objectives of the broader business, whether they're they're about revenue or profitability or you know efficiency or attracting customers or opening new stores? It begins with that. And then the question is, what projects and initiatives are required to enable that strategy? And how are we going to measure whether we're making progress or not? And, and then in that context, we can talk about, okay, well, which which of these projects are more you know, transformational and which are more, you know, transactional or operational, but, you know, we have to perform while we transform. So to your point earlier, that mix has to be right, but it always has to be about the business strategy for me. That's my bias. I mean, just sort of coming up with breakthroughs for the sake of doing it without anchoring it to something, you know, is, um, I, I think that that creates, noise and uh sure. you know kind of annoys people really more than than rallies them to the cause you know? yeah no i hear you no, we talked to we've had people that have come from you know worked at google on the show before and their approach to it's interesting they'll set aside project groups specific almost like uh startups within google that will be focused on a breakthrough they high rate of fail but it's a think tank that doesn't kind of make the rest of the organization noisy. You know, I mean, they've got the size and the resources to be able to do that. But I think as you, as we, as we, you know, the concept of innovation is a big umbrella term, right? But as you, as you compare it to work culture, which you talked about before, is innovation a culture type? You know, is it, is it something that top down, it's ingrained into the team and the business, you hire for it, you retain the innovation, the innovative people on your team. Is it more of an outcome like success, you know, like growth? Uh, or is it something that's just an ongoing need of an organization? It's something that you got to learn and train. Maybe it's a combination of all these things. But when I think about innovation from a from a culture and full organization level, do you see it that way? Or is it certain functions in our business, certain people on our team, those are the ones that we're going to really try to empower to be innovative. And then the rest of the company is going to kind of make sure that the lights stay on and the doors stay open while we do that. I think it's a really interesting question. And I would say that there's two aspects that I would address. The first is about the culture. And the second is about the people who work in the organization. So, so if, in, in my experience, if you want to innovate and you want to go for breakthroughs, fear cannot be a, 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 a cultural dynamic, right? If, if, if people are afraid of failure, being in that innovative space where certainty is low, there's a disconnect there. And I think, you know, uh, kind of cultures that, that, that make people afraid to speak up, to bring diverse perspectives, to do things that have never been done, to fail, uh, you know, to, to make a breakthrough, you know, th that's, makes innovation really, really difficult. And, you know, uh, so the, the leader who wants the value of a, of a breakthrough, but demands the certainty of a marginal improvement is setting their organization up for failure. You can't have both ends of that dichotomy in the sure. same conversation. So that's, that's that. But whether you're going for <clears throat> breakthroughs or not, people's tolerance for change uh, is based on their experience and their beliefs and their values. And so I, I like to think about the skill that an individual has, their competencies to do the job, and their will to tolerate change and to be comfortable uh, course correcting based on mistakes and their ability to be self-aware, right? So if you have the competencies and really high will, then I would call you a change agent. And I definitely want you involved in the more innovative uh, uh, initiatives that we have going on because you're going to grow and you're going to love it and you're going to thrive. If, if you have the competencies to do the job, but as a human being, you require more structure, more certainty because that keeps you from feeling anxious and fearful, then I'm going to call you highly valued. You have a lot of knowledge to help me to be successful. And my job as a leader is to get you in a role with enough boundaries and safety so that you can be who you are. If I put you in a change agent role, you're going to flame out, right? If I put a change agent in a, a, a highly valued role, they're going to be bored and probably leave me. So sure. I think I think we have this, this idea of a, a portfolio of initiatives ranging from, uh, you know, operational to transformational. And then we put our people in roles that are best suited for who they are and 
how they want to grow from a career point of view. And I think it's that magical sort of match that, that makes the difference. That, 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 that's, my, that's my perspective and, and that's been my experience and what I try to do. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, especially talking to a CIO and a guy that's you know, into technology. I, I think of technology that way to some extent. You know, it's amazing. If you look at video conferencing around for a very long time before the pandemic. It wasn't until we had to use it because we were all in our homes that it actually took off and became very popular. You know, some organizations had embraced it and were using it, but a lot of them that we worked with, we're still just using bridge telephone systems and conference calls, right? Uh, and 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 so I wonder if, you know, just the utilization and the adoption of technology throughout the pandemic because it was forced is going to make more people comfortable with change. You know, because in my experience with working with teams and technology, it there was always a fear aspect of the technology going wrong or going bad and ruining the presentation or the pitch or the pre or whatever it was that the team was doing. So do you see that uh, from your perspective, looking after the technology at your organization, that, that that's an opportunity that maybe now people are going to emerge from, I shouldn't say emerge from the pandemic, that now today in 2022, that people are a little bit more comfortable using tools that before the pandemic they may not have used? I think, <clears throat> Without a doubt, people are more comfortable because they were forced to do that. And I think it gets back to this idea that survival demanded that that businesses that maybe were not in favor of this technology adopted it because in order to stay in business and communicate and run your operation, you need to figure out what you were going to do. And, and some business picked one flavor and some picked another. But at the end of the day, everybody had to do that. And people who wanted to continue to work had to learn it, whether they were uncomfortable or not. And so I think these technologies are here to stay now because people have gotten used to them. Um, I don't think they, like in, in our context, if we're gonna be working in the office more frequently, we'll be more comfortable using this uh, Zoom or you know uh, video conferencing. But I don't think in our business, we're going to change the way we operate uh, because we had to do things as an exception in the, pandemic. There are sure. other companies who have said, wow, let's make this exception the rule because in our view, this is strategic. Our people love it. It, you know, it helps us keep our costs down. We're going to shed ourselves of real estate, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, so I, I think, I think because we were forced to do it, people got comfortable. I think um, when you're not forced to do things, you end up with some, some resistance that leads to, you know, decisions like we talked about earlier, whether you have the right people whether you're actually working on on the right things. I, I am concerned that now that we have devices in the middle of our interpersonal relationships, that um, that it erodes our ability to really interact in an authentic way. And it empowers people with a megaphone to, you know, um, do things that they might not have done before these technologies were available. Let me put it that way. I, I see people saying things on platforms that they might not say in front of their family, in front of their church community, in their schools, but somehow with a device, they feel empowered to, you know, state whatever is, you know, on their mind, positive or negative. And I'm not convinced that's, that's a good thing. Um, and so I think these technologies can actually thwart innovation, thwart relationships. And, and we have to be careful as the people who are making these kinds of decisions, um, you know, to, be sure we're, we're using them for, for the greater good. Sure. Yeah, that's wise. Um, let's talk kind of final concept here, but you know, we're, a lot of people are saying we're in a great resignation and we have been now for a few months. Clearly it's hard to attract talent. Lots of people are looking at leaving or considering leaving their, their jobs. There's a lot of different schools of thought as to why, um, that's happening, but, I guess as it as it relates to making sure you've got a great team, uh, making sure you are set up to achieve the innovation or the success of the productivity that you, that you want, or to keep the right people on your team. What advice do you have for leaders as a people leader yourself? Yeah, well, uh, you know, I can only say what my philosophy is, and some people will relate to it, and others won't. But you know, for me, every IT enabled outcome, technology enabled outcome that my group delivers for the businesses where I work, that has to be owned by an employed 
staff member, an employed leader who understands the brand, who's committed to the vision and who is ultimately accountable for that outcome, notwithstanding who does the work. Because in some cases, it makes sense for employees to do that work. But in other cases, it makes sense to extend your reach with partners. Sure. And, and I don't mean abdicate accountability to those partners and blame them when things don't go well. I say uh, we choose partners for things that they can do that might be a limitation for me. So, for example, uh, 24-7 service is crucial in my business. I don't run three shifts with my employed people, so I'm going to hire a partner to deliver 24-7 service for me. I need a whole bunch of different skill sets because, as I said earlier, I don't force my business to pick technologies based on uh, a cloud strategy or a database strategy. So I might have five or six different database technologies in my portfolio of, of technology, of tools. So I need, I need fractional skills from a partner that can bring me what I need when I need it for all those databases. I'm not going to go hire six database technicians. I'm going to hire a firm that has... Uh, all of that for me that I can buy as I as I need it, right? And then um, I'm going to use firms that can provide technological career paths for people who don't want to work in a grocery industry. They want to work in tech. And so then I can employ that partner to bring the best technical resources that I might not be able to hire. So, sure. I, I, you know, my philosophy is to have uh, the right people inside the organization, extended by partners for reasons that uh, uh, enhance my ability to deliver service. And, and I found over time that that works very, very effectively. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because I was just talking to another large organization last week and they introduced me to the idea of a technology scout, which I thought I, I hadn't and what a cool business that would be. But basically, they hired a partner that would go out and travel the world and look for emerging tech that would be hyper relevant to their business. So same same type of idea is a core group of people within the organization, knowing their skill set, having their, you know, uh, achieving the goals set, set forth, but then leveraging partners to kind of complement what that team is able to do. So I think that's great. Uh, I think that's a really interesting perspective. I mean, that reminds me of my favorite quote by Einstein, which is no problem can be solved from the consciousness that created it. We, we need to learn to see the world anew and learning to see the world. And that just means if you've been doing something the same way for a long time, it might be difficult for you to find that innovation or that new way. So what you just described is that's how you see the world anew. You allow outside expertise to bring uh, innovative ideas to you, technologies, business processes. And then as a leader, you get to decide which ones you want to take on. But I think that's a brilliant strategy, especially if, you know, you're really good at doing things one way and you want to find something outside the box to to consider or take on. That's cool. Definitely. So so tell me, Ron, what's what's something you're looking forward to in the next 12 months? I think I know the answer, but tell me uh, <laughs> tell me something that, you, that that you got on your plate that you're real excited about. Well, we're doing we're you know in, in the business we're uh, we, we got a lot of great projects going on that we don't talk much about. You know, personally, um, I'm I, I love teaching leadership. I mentioned I teach at Cal State LA. I've now gotten involved in the criminal justice system to bring some of the the the, the fundamental self-awareness and, and leadership competencies into that context so that when people get out, they can uh, have some tools that might help them find jobs and keep jobs. The, the group I'm working with is teaching coding and I'm, I'm helping to, to add uh, you know, a leadership dimension to their curriculum. I'm working with a group called the Women's Empowerment Institute. Uh, they help uh, young women of color get skills to uh, get out of poverty and, and earn enough money to take care of their families. And they're, you know, doing amazing things. And I, I've written a book that that should come out in the first quarter of next year with some of the things that we've talked about today and just a number of things about driving change and leading change and working with people uh, to to be them best, their best selves and, 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 and deliver breakthrough results. And so uh, that should be out first quarter next year. Maybe we'll have a chance to talk a little bit about that in the future sometime. Definitely. And while we wait, is there a resource that's been valuable to you in your career that you would recommend to others? A top kind of podcast, book, it could be anything. Uh, uh, absolutely. I love Brene Brown. 
Mm, and, yeah. and her her work on 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 shame and understanding ourselves uh, as translates into the leadership domain, and and she's got a bunch of books and podcasts. I think I think her work is <clears throat> really really amazing and and very helpful. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, I love the book Designing Your Life. It's written by a couple of guys at Stanford who take design thinking and apply it to individuals as they think about their careers. And so there's some really, really interesting things there. And Emotional Intelligence 2.0 is a great book relative to uh, understanding yourself, uh, managing your emotions, and learning to work more effectively with others who, who may be different than you. So those, those are three of the things that are top of mind for me. Love it. Three recommendations, not just one. We'll include those on the in the show notes when we post this episode. Um, final question, Ron, if you were going to retire today, what's a, a word of wisdom that you would leave for your teammates or for those who follow in your footsteps? I think as we started the show, you have to be open to learning from your experiences and you got to lean into your discomfort because that's where you learn and you have to seek feedback and pay attention uh, to the mistakes that you make and the successes that you achieve. Try not to make the same mistake twice, um, but try to, by living in that discomfort zone and having those experiences and learning from them, you expand your comfort zone and you become a better leader and a more effective uh, you know, human being. And so that, that's the, the main piece of advice that, that, that I would share. I love that. Well, you've given us a lot of insight and a lot of advice on this on this uh, show today, Ron. Thank you so much for being here. Excited. Well, we got to wait a year, but excited for the book to eventually come out. Thanks for everything you and the team at Trader Joe's are doing. Uh, it's a great experience every time I go there. Uh, can't thank you enough for the time today. And George, thanks for what you're doing. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun to have the conversation, and I hope it's useful. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this conversation, please take a moment to rate our show. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the Work Inspired Podcast so that you don't miss any of the incredible guests we have planned for upcoming episodes. We'll continue to find the best and brightest minds in business so that you can learn, grow, and succeed, and so that we can all work inspired. Work Inspired is brought to you by BOS, a leader in commercial working environments and a Hayworth best-in-class dealership. Experience our 360 approach and discover the team, tools, and techniques required to navigate the complexity of your next workspace at BOS.com. If you have ideas, feedback, or would like to be featured on our show, please email podcast at BOS.com. Thank you for listening. This has been a Workspace Digital production. If you're interested in launching a podcast at your organization, please email info at workspace.digital for a free consultation.